It's the last night, the last Dhamma talk. I hope you all had a really good retreat. Um, it was fantastic working with you all. All of you really uh, abided ardently, like truly every one of you. So fantastic. Thank you. So tonight we're going to be doing Sutta MN 61, Advice to Rahula at Ambalatika. This will be a little, little different focus here tonight. Um, we'll be talking about Dhamma and meditation, but we'll be also talking about re-entry into our daily lives. And, um, and that's what the focus will be on as we return to our busyness tomorrow. So Rahula uh, was the son of the Buddha. When, uh, when the Buddha went on his quest for complete awakening, Rahula was a newborn. And so uh, the Buddha left shortly after his birth. Um, I often imagine that was as difficult as uh, the, the, all, any of the ascetic practices in a way for the unenlightened bodhisattva to leave his firstborn son. When, Ra, when Rahula was seven uh, and the Buddha was the Buddha, um, the Buddha was back in his hometown. And at that time, um, that's when they met again. So uh, Rahula's mother asked him to go speak with his father and ask for his inheritance. I believe what she meant was asking for the heirship to the, to the kingdom, for the Buddha's father was still alive at the time, so technically Buddha was, the Buddha was still the heir. But instead, uh, the Buddha told Sariputta to ordain him, uh, and so he became a monk. And this began the Vinaya rule of no minor can, be, uh, can become a monk without the consent of their parents. Rahula was first for foremost in desiring uh, training. So that was, uh, he was very uh, exuberant about receiving the training. In this instance, this uh, sutta was given probably shortly after he was ordained. And it was given after an incident where Rahula gave incorrect directions to someone looking for the Buddha. And so this is the Buddha talking to him uh, about that. Thus as I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the, the squirrel sanctuary. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Rahula was living in Ambalatika. Then, when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and went to the Venerable Rahula at Ambalatika. The Venerable Rahula saw the Blessed One coming in the distance and made a seat ready and set out water for washing the feet. The Blessed One sat down on the seat made ready and washed his feet. The Venerable Rahula paid homage to him and sat down at one side. Then the, Ven the Blessed One left a little water in the water vessel and asked the Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this little water left in the water vessel? Yes, Venerable Sir. Even so little, Rahula, is the recluship of those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie. Then the Blessed One threw away the little water that was left and asked the Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see that little water that was thrown away? Yes, Venerable Sir. Even so, Rahula, those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie have thrown away their recluseship. 
Then the Venerable One turned the water vessel upside down and asked the Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this water vessel turned upside down? Yes, Venerable Sir. Even so, Rahula, those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie have turned their reckless ship upside down. Then the Blessed One turned the water vessel right way up again and asked the Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this hollow, empty water vessel? Yes, Venerable Sir. Even so hollow and empty, Rahula, is the recluse ship of those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie. So this is a pretty, pretty clear um, admonishment. Um, pretty clear for a seven or eight year old with a clear analogy. Uh, very direct. I imagine it must have been um, uh, clear and hit home. Yet there's no yelling, no punishment um, like that. Suppose, Rahula, there were a, a royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, full grown in stature, high bred, and accustomed to battle. In battle, he would perform his task with his forefeet and his hind feet, with his four quarters and his hind quarters, with his head and his ears, with his tusks and his tail. Yet he would keep back his trunk. Then his rider would think, this royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, full grown in stature, high bred and accustomed to battle, performs his task with his forefeet four feet and hind feet, with his four quarters and his hind quarters, with his head and his ears, with his tusks and his tail, yet he keeps back his trunk. He has not given up his life. But when the royal tusker elephant, with tusks as long as chariot poles, full grown in stature, high bred and accustomed to battle, performs his tasks with his four feet and his hind feet, with his four quarters and his hind quarters, with his head and ears, with his tusks and tail, and also with his trunk, then his rider would think, this royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, full grown in stature, high bred, accustomed to battle, performs his tasks in battle with his four, four feet and hind feet, with his four quarters and his hind quarters, with his head and his ears, with his tusks and his tail, and also with his trunk. He has given up his life. Now that there is nothing, now there is nothing that this royal tusker would not do. So too, Rahula, when one is not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie, there is no evil, I say, that one would not do. Therefore, Rahula, you should train thus. I will not utter a falsehood even as a joke. So this is a pretty clear teaching about the fourth precept. Um, no harsh speech, telling lies, slander of speech, and gossip. The fourth precept maybe seems like a simple one, but I think for many people it can be challenging because our speech is fast. Our speech is fast and it's connected to our thinking and our thinking can be fast. And we have habits of uh, making jokes that are false. That, that is a habit. Habits of, uh, can have habits of cursing, saying harsh things. Um, and these habits are hard to, hard to break. Um, so when you're telling lies or telling things that are not true or saying things that are not true, your mind doesn't really know the difference. We know this with brain studies. Uh, when you read or say something, part of your brain thinks it's true, just assumes it's true because those words were said. So part of your mind, when you say something like that, has that image. Another part of your mind knows that's not true. 
And of course, reality is not like that too. That's not how things are happening. And this sets up a big mental dissonance between what you say, what you think, and what you were trying to accomplish. And this builds up dissonance with time. People who are accustomed to lying often lose track of what they really feel about things or really think about things. And it can be hard to know what their reality actually is. And so we have to change how we make our jokes. Or when we make a joke with a falsehood, immediately clarify it for ourselves and others. It's an odd thing. It means little white lies are not that helpful. Yes, we're saying them in order to give someone comfort or pay them a compliment or do something nice. And that is a good motivation, but it actually doesn't work out that well. Not only is it much nicer to receive a compliment of something that is actually true, yeah, it's much better to really receive a compliment of something that is true rather than something you know people are saying to be nice to you. It confuses your mind and it sets up your meditation to be less productive. And it's not always easy to say the truth. And this is another reason why we don't. There are difficult truths to say hard for us to face them, and we have concern they would be hard for someone else to face them. In my professional life, I have to talk to people about difficult things, diagnoses that are new and challenging, outcomes that they are not interested in hearing about at the moment. And it's always better to say what the truth is clearly. That's what people actually want. They actually want you to be present with them as a person facing the reality with them. And that's what we can do with the meditation practice. We can be present. We're training to be present with difficult things. We've had hindrances all week. Some of them very painful. So we know what happens when we can allow and accept the difficult thing. And we know what happens next. And we, when we can allow and accept other people's difficult emotions, and challenging reaction with spaciousness and loving kindness, we know what can happen next. Even if you're not sure the person can understand the truth, you should still should try to present it as best you can. This doesn't mean our job is running around proclaiming the bitter truth, the brutality of whatever it is as much as possible. Yeah, no. We say what's appropriate at the time it's appropriate to the best of our, our ability. And that, of course, is a challenging thing to do. And there are not many rules in the Dhamma exactly how to do that. We have guidelines. We know when we're with loving kindness, we are set to do that. We know when we're present, when we know when we're accepting, we are set to do that. And so this sutta talks a little bit about how to evaluate what we do, think and say, so we can become more and more skillful in how we do those difficult things and those fun things. What do you think, Rahula? What is the purpose of a mirror? 
the purpose of reflection, Venerable Sir. So too, Rahula, an action with the body should be done after repeated reflection. An action by speech should be done after repeated reflection. An action by mind should be done after repeated reflection. Rahula, when you wish to do an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Would this action that I wish to do with the body lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both? Is it an unpleasant, unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences and painful results? When you reflect, if you know, this action that I wish to do with the body would lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both. It is an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you definitely should not do such an action with the body. But when, if you reflect, if you know, this is an action that I wish to do with with the body would not, this action that I wish to do with the body would not lead to, lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. Then you may do such an action with the body. So we're starting to look beyond uh, uh, the, the beginning instructions of Sila. Um, Sila helps us avoid the unwholesome and the unwholesome courses of action and points us to the wholesome courses of action. And so we know how to start taking them. And then, then we evaluate what happens and how to do that better. Also Rahula, while you were doing an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Does this action that I'm doing with the body lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Is it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know, this action that I'm doing with the body leads to my own affliction or to the affliction of others, or to, or to the affliction of both, it is an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences. Then you should suspend such a bodily action. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I'm doing with the body does not lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both, it is a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results, then you may continue in such a bodily action. Also Rahula, after you have done such an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Did the action I did with the body lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Was it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences? with painful results. When you reflect, if you know, this action that I did with the body led to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both. It was an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you should confess such a bodily action, reveal it, and lay it open to the teacher or to your wise companions in the holy life. Having confessed it, revealed it, and laid it open, you should undertake restraint for the future. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I did with the body did not lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both, it was a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, pleasant results. You can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. 
So one thing I appreciate about the monastic uh, discipline is how conflict is dealt with. An advantage to having so many rules is frequently one can be clear if a rule is broken or not, if, uh, if something should have happened differently. And then there are procedures for what you do in that case. You acknowledge the action and you talk about it with your peers or your teacher. You, with that acknowledgement, they can acknowledge that with you. And together, you can work together and you can determine not to do that again. This is a safe, clear way to work with conflict and mistakes. I think a reason it is difficult for us to acknowledge mistakes until we start reflecting on it is because one, we have to admit we are wrong. I was wrong. I didn't know. I should have done better. I, I, I. And what comes back is yes, you were wrong. Yeah. How dare you? You know, instead of forgiveness and acceptance, sometimes what you get back is anger and not acceptance. And it's worse, <laughs> worse to admit it, or that's the fear. Both of these increase the sense of I. I must be right, so I am protected. And I must be bad because I am being treated wrong. So these are things that we consciously or unconsciously are thinking about when we are coming to the place that we can admit we were incorrect and wrong. But what has to happen is we have to acknowledge that we made a mistake so we can forgive it because the mistake is in our mind. We remember. And we know, even if we're protecting ourselves. And so the procedure is clear. When we notice we've made a mistake, we admit it to ourselves. We forgive ourselves for making a mistake and we apologize and bring it uh, to, to the other party if possible. And hopefully they will forgive us and work with us too. Sometimes it's not possible to make the apology for many reasons. We may not know the person anymore. The situation may be gone. It may have been long in the past. It may be inappropriate. For example, middle school. Middle school is from 11 to 13 years of age or so. I recently was introduced to some research about middle school that something about four to five percent of friendships from middle school last until high school. Four to five percent. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that well, but at least at my middle school, people were pretty awkward and difficult. A lot of mistakes were made. And that's actually what the research is showing. A lot of mistakes were made because people were figuring it out. They didn't know how to treat other people or how to be treated or what to do. And so, yeah, we all have a lot of mistakes, but it's probably not appropriate to track the mistakes down, find the people that we were uh, inappropriate to, or whatever it was, and apologize right now. But what, what can we do? So we can forgive ourselves. We can do forgiveness practice. We can remember. We can talk to our peers. We can talk to a teacher. We can talk to someone with our 
with our uh, with our stuff like this that can view it non-judgmentally. When you bring your middle school mishaps to your friends, though it may be weighing on you, they immediately can see the truth that you were in middle school and that you didn't know better and that it's okay. And when you see that they see that it's okay, you can let it go. That's how we let go of things, through forgiving ourselves when they're stuck, bringing it to our peers who can help us see it's okay. And when we can't bring it to anyone for reasons, then we can again do the forgiveness practice with time. We can write it out. We can admit it, uh, confess it in front of a Buddha image or another image like that. And we can let it out that way. Rahula, when you wish to do an action with the speech, with speech, you should reflect upon that same verbal action thus. Would this action that I wish to do with speech lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? It is an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. When you reflect, if you know, this action that I wish to do with the body would lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you definitely should not do such an action with speech. But when you reflect, if you know this action that I wish to, wish to do with speech would not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both, it is a wholesome verbal action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results, then you may do such an action with speech. Doing pleasant actions with speech and with body and with mind helps us improve our practice. Many of these are mindfulness practices. We can share loving kindness directly with other people. By carefully choosing your speech, you can help people smile. This can take practice, uh, but with practice and reflection, you can get better. Usually, a good ingredient is to be present with them, to be as most yourself as possible, authentic, and be having fun. And then you can try out your jokes that are, of course, are true or whatever you do. Helping people laugh and smile should be a job that you give yourself. This keeps you focused in situations. If you remember your job is to help people smile, when you do things that are otherwise boring, it'll help keep you present. If your job is to help make the grocery store person, checkout person, bagger smile, that can make their day. More and more we're disconnected from contact with people, with technology. More and more we don't have to do these small little interactions. I used to have to go to the bank to deposit checks that people gave me. Now I take pictures of them on my phone and it's really convenient, but I'll tell you, I really enjoyed going to the bank because it was people I saw occasionally that saw me occasionally. And we had an opportunity for a moment to interact with each other and it could be fun and we could joke about things and laugh. When you have those interactions with people, it lasts with both of you and you take that with you. 
People used to have to interact with people all the time directly. We used to have to talk to people on the phone. We used to have to talk to people at the store to get our groceries. Now we can get them delivered. We are used to having that social interaction and it's somewhat of a loss, a big loss to not have that ongoing pleasant reinforcement, that opportunity to be happy and to help other people be happy. So when you have the opportunity to have a pleasant random interaction, I highly recommend you pay attention and try. There's fewer of those present these days. Also Rahula, while you were doing an action with speech, you should reflect on that same verbal action thus. Does this action I'm doing with speech lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Is it an unwholesome verbal action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know, this action that I'm doing with speech leads to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is an unwholesome verbal action with painful consequences, with painful results then you should suspend such a verbal action. But when you reflect, if you know, this is an action that I'm doing with the, with speech does not affect my, does not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is a wholesome verbal action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. Then you may continue in such a verbal action. So maybe you're getting the sense this is about skill development, the sutta. It's about having a plan, executing the plan, observing how the plan works, and then reflecting on the consequences of the plan and how it worked. This is applicable to any skill. This is how you practice instruments effectively or practice martial arts effectively. It, it can be how you practice your meditation effectively. Now, we're not doing a skill that we do. We're not working on becoming, like we talked about last night. But as we can still use this reflection in our practice, especially when you're out in the world, you can reflect how is your quality of life improving? Are things getting lighter? Are they getting easier? Is life more fun? That's how it should be looking. Over time, there will be good and bad days, good and bad weeks even, but the trajectory should be more fun, better quality of life. And your practice, you can reflect on as well. And as you know, you can't judge a meditation session by how many hindrances it has in the beginning, in the middle, or the end. They're going to show up when they do. And they're not a problem, they're an opportunity. But you can reflect on what you are trying to support and encourage in your practice. You can think, well, I'm going to sit down and I'll be working on being in quiet mind, maybe, or I'll be working on sending with my friend, or I'll be working on oh, sending joy. We can see what you think your plan will be. Oh, that's right, I've been having that hindrance come up. I've been needing to seize. I've been having meditation pain. Sometimes you get hindrances like needing to sneeze every single time. I hope you don't. But it may show up every single time you sit down and you have to deal with the urge to sneeze or cough for a while. But when you have something like that, and it will pass eventually. Then you have your plan. Well, their meditation pain might happen. So I'll do this. Then you enjoy your practice and afterwards you reflect. Okay, that went well. That didn't go well. Okay, 
that happened, what a surprise. Just a moment or two before and after helps keep you focused when you're in your busy life and things are distracting and it's a long time after retreat. Also Rahula, after you've done an action with speech, you should reflect on that same verbal action thus. Did this action that I did with the with speech lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Was it an unwholesome verbal action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know, this action I did with the speech, with speech led to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both was unwholesome verbal action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you should confess such a verbal action, reveal it, and lay it open to the teacher or to your wise companions in the holy life. Having confessed it, revealed it, and laid it open, you should undertake restraint for the future. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I did with speech did not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It was a wholesome verbal action with pleasing consequences, pleasant results. You can abide happy and glad training day and night with wholesome states. Now one good thing about uh, our technology these days is we can stay connected with our Sangha. So one thing I encourage people is to find a meditation group that you can meet with regularity, regularly. And I don't mean to meditate with on Zoom regularly. I mean to, to meet once a week, twice a month, to talk about your practice. One or three couple people you know that you can share and reflect what's happening. And so you can support each other. So you can put it in your busy schedule and you'll all meet for that hour. Uh, it's easy with Zoom. And then you can continue to provide each other with that non-judgmental space for what's going well and what's not going well. Remind each other about the practice and remind each other uh, what to do. And that can keep momentum going fantastically. Yeah, and now we it's, it's a button click away absolutely remarkable. Um, Rahula, when you wish to do an action with the mind, you should reflect on that same mental action thus. Would this action that I wish to do with the mind lead to my own affliction or the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Is it an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences with painful results? When you reflect, if you know, this action that I wish to do with the mind would lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you definitely should not do such an action with the mind. But when you reflect, if you know, this is an action that I wish to do with this action that I wish to do with the mind would not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is a wholesome mental action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. Then you may do such an action with the mind. So we're not talking about all mental uh, events here. We can loosely divide mental events for the sake of this into two categories. One that we intend to do and the other or that we do not intend to do. As you may have noticed, most of our mental events are unintended. Um, absolutely. When you have an unwholesome, unintended mental event, that's a hindrance. That's not what we're talking about here. When that comes up, you treat it with humor, you allow it to be there, you relax, smile, come back to what you're doing. 
these unbidden mental events, uh, these can be surprising. These are sometimes people's first glimpse into anatta or not self. What a surprise. My mind is producing thoughts all on its own. I thought I was doing that, but no. And they can be quite concerning uh, when we don't understand we didn't do them either. The mental events we're talking about uh, that we are, are judging are, are volitional mental events. Choosing how we think of a situation choosing how we judge a situation or a person, choosing to bring up loving kindness or not. It's okay to have opinions about things and it's okay to have negative opinions about things because we have our opinions and some things are not as skillful as they could be to say the least. But we can choose not to perseverate on these and not to dwell on them over and over again that sets us up for suffering and that sets and colors our interaction in the future. And we can choose to, to bring loving kindness even to the unwholesome events in our life. And that's actually our job. Also Rahula, while you were doing an action with the mind, you should reflect on that same mental action thus. Does this action I'm doing with the mind lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Is it an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know, this action that I'm doing with the mind leads to my affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both, it is an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences, with painful results, then you should suspend such a mental action. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I'm doing with the mind does not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both, it is a wholesome mental action with pleasant consequences and pleasant results then you may continue with such a mental action. And continuing with wholesome mental actions is our task in daily life. And this is talking about developing persisting mindfulness in what we do, bringing loving kindness to all our activities. And arguably this is a very challenging task, especially if we treat it as a task. If you decide today I'm going to be mindful all the time, I assure you within a short period of time you will forget all about it. You'll have much better luck deciding to smile all the time. You'll have much better luck setting up behaviors or reminders for yourself to remind it. At first you need to make mindfulness a habit, a pleasant habit that mind likes to rest in and incline in. This is something we ease into, not something we can make happen. It is surprising how quickly we can forget our goal of remembering to radiate metta all day. But as we do this more and more and have more and more cues, we'll find ourselves in places always remembering to smile, always remembering to live loving kindness, always remembering to bring up jhana, when we rest, always remembering, and before long, it'll occur to you, huh, I have been smiling for quite a number of hours here. Um, not with effort, not with trying, with habit, with making it attractive for your mind to rest in that. That's how it can work. And you can try to be mindful if you want. If you, if you like hindrances or if you like frustration, but um, yeah. Also Rahula, after you have done an action with the mind, you should reflect on that same mental action thus. 
Did this action that I did with the mind lead to my own affliction or the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Was it an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know, this action that I did with the mind led to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both, it was an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences, with painful result. Then we should review, uh, review these mental actions and view them with disenchantment. What is missing from this is confessing mental action. It is not suggested to confess uh, negative mental action um, like that. But when you reflect, if you know, this action I did with the mind did not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both. It was a wholesome mental action with pleasant consequences, pleasant results. You can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. And the instructions are to develop just disenchantment and dispassion to unwholesome mental events. So your mind naturally will drop them and not get involved and stop doing that. Um, Rahula, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past purified their bodily action, their verbal action, and their mental action, all did so by repeatedly reflecting thus. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will purify their bodily action, their verbal action, and their mental action, all will do so by repeatedly reflecting thus. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the present are purifying their bodily action, their verbal action, and their mental action, all are doing so by repeatedly reflecting thus. Therefore, Rahula, you should train thus. We will purify our bodily action, our verbal action, our mental action, by repeatedly reflecting upon them. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Rahula was delighted in the, satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So I thought that was a nice sutta, uh, nice instruction to Rahula. And so now we'll be bringing back our practice to our daily life and we'll be restructuring and trying to bring practice in with us. So a couple of basic recommendations. One is regular meditation practice. I suggest you find a time and schedule it if you don't have one already. We are incredibly busy, at least I think we all are. That is, that is lay life, dusty, yeah, cramped, packed schedules. And so we need to find time for it in our schedules. Um, otherwise, we'll forget. We'll find ourselves in bed at 11.30 about to fall asleep and eyes will pop open. We'll like, oh no, didn't meditate today. Then you have to get out of bed at 11.30 and go meditate for half an hour, an hour. And we all know what will happen then, right? And we'll go back, we'll go to sleep. And then we might find ourselves in exactly the same position the next day. You know, habitual tendencies. So it's good to schedule this. Scheduling first thing in the morning is a fantastic way to do it. And this works well for most people. We can control our alarm clock. And so we can wake up a little earlier if necessary. Um, like that. Before bed is another really nice time, and both if you can pull it off. I think it is good to meditate at least an hour. So now that you're off, when you're off retreat, you'll notice a dip in the level of your practice. And this dip will happen um, if you can consistently meditate at least an hour or more. The dip will, you'll, you'll improve over time. 
two hours is another fantastic goal. This is, if you can find the time to do that, I definitely recommend two hours. Uh, however, more than that, as a goal, I would be cautious about. Two hours is a lot as it is. If you have time and energy and space to do more than two hours, great. But two hours is a lot to do every day. And what we want is a practice that goes every day. We want a practice that we do every day. We want to look back months later, years later, and oh wow, progress happened. I didn't notice it at the time, but wow. And that happens with a consistent daily practice. If we meditate for a week for three hours a day and then we don't get back to it for three months, that doesn't work. If we have a goal of sitting for three hours a day and then we do that twice a week, not so good either. So schedule what you can, what you think you can do, and be realistic. If it's an hour, fine. That's, that's good. If it's a half an hour, okay. If you don't think you have time for half an hour, I think you need to evaluate your situation carefully and prioritize. We are very, very busy. I myself am scheduled every minute of every day of every day of the week. I know what I'm doing all the time, literally, including recreation and all of that. That's what happens to many of us when we are busy in professional life with families, with commitments. And that's not a problem. That's not a problem at all. But that's what we are working with. And, and if you have a schedule like that, then you have to make room for your practice. And you have to view it maybe a little uh, ruthlessly and really look at the priorities. Um, when you can't find a half an hour for practice, there might be a work-life imbalance happening. And that's no fun. That's no fun at all. Our job is to help people be happy and have fun. And I like work. I, I enjoy work a lot. A lot of people enjoy work. I hope you do too. And if you don't, I hope you can smile through it. But we, what good are we doing if we're working that much and we don't have time to be with our loved ones and we don't have time to spread happiness with them and we don't have time to work on our spiritual practice. Yeah. So set the alarm clock a little early and, and consider the priorities. This is something that you can look forward to, that you prioritize because it's fun, right? It's pleasant, it's joyful. And so, so let it be that, just like you wouldn't miss brushing your teeth, don't miss uh, your meditation practice. But we are busy and sometimes we are busy particularly as lay people. And this means we have to prioritize all the time practice when, when things are truly not able to be done. That has to be our focus. Because um, even if something very difficult happens and our hour or two hour sit is disrupted, we are awake the rest of the time. When we are awake, we can be practicing and we can bring our practice in everything we do. And we probably should. Everything we do, we can treat it as a problem or treat it as something we can accept. Even our stressful situations, our difficult situations, we can bring loving kindness to that and work with that. So the, all the time practices are very helpful to incorporate for those people who 
actually have some days they can't practice. So the all the time practices involve meditation cues. We talked about smiling all the time, smiling at people, putting your sticky notes in random places. Also recommend finding places in your work environment that you frequent quickly or, re or frequently, maybe on the way to the restroom. We all go there a couple times per day. You find yourself in that same stairwell, going through that same corridor, only for that reason, that can be your meditation cue. So every time we're there, we can remind ourselves to do that. We can fill our environment with meditation cues. There are Buddha images. Those are great. Um, those are clear reminders. And there are other things that we have, again, in our work environment that when we see them, they can remind us. Many work environments uh, don't want anything of a religious or a spiritual nature around. So we pick uh, a flower or a Bodhi leaf. Bodhi leaves are fantastic. Very few people know what they represent, and they're nice leaves. I have them in my office, uh, yep, in the hallway. Great reminder. So we should remind ourselves with cues and remind ourselves to be present and embrace what happens to us with loving kindness. Aversive situations don't have to be suffering. They can be painful, but like a hindrance, they can be embraced and worked with. And that's what we get to do. I mean, our choice is to either either suffer or to work with it skillfully, simply. Like that. But as we do this, um, as we use our practice, I also want to caution against a, a thing or two. One is using our practice to help us push ourselves too much. With this practice, we're learning to tolerate difficult situations, painful uh, sensations, emotions, and learn to transform them into collectedness and joy. Eventually, we have access to joy whenever we turn our mind to it. And we develop concentration, collectedness, ability to stick with tasks that's remarkable. Great. Don't use that to fill your schedule more. Don't build yourself a schedule that is only navigatable by your meditation skills. It's a temptation. Now that you can, oh my, I can do so much more. Aside, I, I, I am concerned about corporate mindfulness programs like that and so on for productivity in workplaces. Like we have a difficult job and we train people to be mindful and all of a sudden they can increase their productivity. And all of a sudden we have a workplace that you can only navigate by being incredibly mentally skillful. Mm -hmm. No, that's a temptation. Don't do that to yourselves. It's possible to keep yourself on the edge of burnout by working, doing as much as you can, managing your schedule perfectly, managing your mind perfectly, figuring out how all the pieces work together and find yourself with no gas in the tank and no flexibility to change that because all of a sudden you're burnt out. But you can smile and you can deal with it. So be careful. Be careful how you work with your life. Make time to be generous to yourself. Make time to be generous to your family and those around you. Yep. And that's, that's, uh, that's something to watch out for with this. But be joyful, right? Bring this to people around you. You'll naturally become a reliable person to people and you'll naturally be someone they can count on because your mind will be steady and you can listen to them 
and you can hear them. And not everyone is doing that. So it's a wonderful gift you can give yourself and your peers and your family. Just like that. Okay. Let's share some there. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings find this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas and mighty power, share in this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.